From Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American Original. For over two decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. There's a world of investment opportunities out there. Spotting them takes experts on the ground, assessing potential firsthand. Templeton, a pioneer in global investing for over 50 years. Gain from our perspective. If, for such a small word, it packs a wallop. If I live to 100, if Social Security isn't enough, if my heart gets broken, if she says yes. We believe if should never hold you back. If should be managed with a plan that builds on what you already have. Together, we can create a personal safety net, a launching pad for all those brilliant ifs in the middle of life. You can call on our expertise and get guarantees for the if in life. After all, we're MetLife. Issue one, McChrystal axed. I accepted General Stanley McChrystal's resignation as commander of the International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan. The move came after General McChrystal and his aides made objectionable remarks about the Obama administration in Get This Rolling Stone magazine. As McChrystal's successor, President Obama tapped the former commander of U.S. forces in Iraq, General David Petraeus. General Petraeus fully participated in our review last fall, and he both supported and helped design the strategy that we have in place. This is a change in personnel, but it is not a change in policy. President Obama then laid out that policy. We have a clear goal. We are going to break the Taliban's momentum. So what is the U.S. policy towards the Taliban? The policy is to break their momentum, and I think that's the right way to phrase it. You're not going to have a defeat in the classic sense where you kill every last Talib. You're not going to have them surrender as one. What you want to do is break their momentum. They've been gaining it, meaning they've been gaining capability, and the government's capability has been shrinking. You want to reverse that, shrink the Taliban down to the point where it's manageable by the government of Afghanistan. So now, look, this is a difficult task. But Obama made the right move sending Petraeus there. Now he needs a better civilian and diplomatic team in place, and he needs to walk back his uh, deadline, which has played disastrously on the ground. So he's implicitly and explicitly admitting that the Taliban cannot be defeated. Well, they can be defeated the way you defeat an insurgency, the way we've mostly defeated an he's insurgency in He's going to slow the momentum. Right, but what you do is you slow their momentum until they're a relatively isolated group of extremists. We've seen this happening in Iraq. It's more or less happened in Colombia. Are those insurgencies disappeared and gone and quote-unquote defeated? No, but as a practical matter, the government has defeated them as an existential threat. The Russians tried this for 14 years and were defeated at the end. Well, and they withdrew. Well, maybe it's time to reassess the policy, but the Rolling Stone article that precipitated this personnel change was trash-talking members of the administration, but General McChrystal did not trash-talk the policy. The policy remains, and General Petraeus, as the President said, is one of the architects, the key architect of this policy. He uh, made it work in Iraq. Problem is, Afghanistan is very different from Iraq. In Iraq, there are two or three ethnic groups. There are hundreds of tribes in Afghanistan. So far, the, the war is going badly. But General Petraeus is the indispensable man. If he cannot make it work, nobody can. And he, therefore, if he can step up after a period of time and says this isn't working, I think he gives uh, the president uh, an, an exit route if clearly this is a failing policy. We don't know that yet, but the assessment will be made, I think, now and again later this year because this uh, whole brouhaha has put the war back in the headlines, and this June is the deadliest month in this nine-year war. So it's time we paid attention. General McChrystal's mistake was actually, it actually opened up a providential opportunity for the president and for General Petraeus. I think Obama did make the right move here. I think it was a master stroke to put Petraeus in. And remember, Petraeus actually accepted a demotion as commander of U.S. Central Command to take over the Afghanistan effort. There has to be, and I think Petraeus is actually going to press for a lot of changes in strategy and tactics. First and foremost, as Rich points out, he's going to argue to Obama, you got to lift that, that self-imposed withdrawal deadline. You've got to give me a relatively open-ended commitment from this administration that I can go and do what I need to do here to, to make this thing work. Secondly, counterinsurgency. Why we are failing in Afghanistan is because it's been a population-centric approach. 
what Petraeus has learned from, from Iraq and the success there is that that has to be coupled with an enemy-centric approach. That's what Petraeus is going to bring to the game. And also the change in the rules of engagement, John, so that our troops are not hamstrung on the ground and local commanders mm. have greater leeway to do what they need to do. And let's not forget another big component of this, which is Pakistan. And I think General Petraeus is going to lean on the president to say, you've got to couple these changes in strategy and tactics with a really more aggressive approach approach to Pakistan because they're exploiting this to try to get a foothold uh, into Afghanistan. General Barnett, before I turn to you, uh, is Karzai the key? Is Karzai the exit key? Those within the Taliban leadership structure who again are not part of Al-Qaeda or the terrorist networks or ideologically against Afghanistan's progress and are willing to march ahead with their the rest of their people in their country towards a better future for, for Afghanistan uh, are welcome. Afghan President Hamid Karzai met with President Obama two months ago at the White House. He addressed the travail of the decade-long war in Afghanistan and also the Obama-Karzai plan to end the U.S. war against the Al-Qaeda within the Taliban. And President Obama gave his stamp of approval. The United States supports the efforts of the Afghan government to open the door to Taliban who cut their ties to Al-Qaeda, abandon violence, and accept the Afghan constitution, including respect for human rights. Karzai cuts the deal with the Taliban. He deals with them. That's our reason for exiting. The war is over. It's what about that? Except with the balance of forces on the ground today, what that deal would look like would essentially be a more Taliban government than a Karzai government. It would not be a government that we could have any confidence would not in fact be in league with al-Qaeda. That's why the, the idea is that we can shift the balance of forces enough to get a deal that we'd like, and I think that's a pipe dream. Isn't that Karzai's problem? Can't Karzai cut the right deal? Karzai can bring the Taliban into the government. Ka Karzai is an extremely weak figure. Karzai also has no virtually no interest in fighting this war. Remember, the whole premise of counterinsurgency doctrine is they have to own it. It has to be their war. That's exactly what is going on exactly the opposite in Afghanistan today. Karzai didn't even know which provinces we were fighting in, according to the Rolling Stone article. Would well, you, if you were counseling the president, would you counsel him to tell Karzai not to cut a deal with the Taliban? Or would you not see that as your exit I don't, route? I look, we have, he, Obama we, has to get out. The, this, the is fact, a, the fact, this is going the to fact, be his the Vietnam. Fact, the fact that Karzai wants to cut a, ta a deal with the Taliban is evidence of the fact that our, that our strategy is going to fail. There, there is going to be some kind of deal. It's going to be a very bad deal, and we're not going to be able to change it. Okay, yeah. hold on, please. The cost <laughs> of the war. The U.S. military in Afghanistan, 1,136 dead. U.S. military amputees, civilly injured, injured, mentally ill in Afghanistan, 6,469. Federal dollars spent on the war, $300 billion. Length of the war, 104 months, eight years and eight months. Question, in his 08 campaign for president, President Obama staked his presidential credibility on victory in Afghanistan. Does he regret that he made that promise or that commitment? I Ellen. don't know that he used the word victory, but I don't know how you would define victory, and I think that's what the administration has to uh, concentrate on. And victory what, is our exit. What are, the, what are the goals and how do you accomplish them? And I think that the fight on Capitol Hill is going to be over the withdrawal date beginning in July of 2011. That is entirely appropriate because you cannot have an open-ended war. Is well, Afghanistan is, Obama's Vietnam? No, no, that, that's ridiculous. It's way too soon to say that. A couple way things. Way too soon. A couple, a couple things, John. We've lost 1,000. A couple things. One, we paid a terrible price, obviously. The, the, you have to honor those men and women who have made that sacrifice. Eleanor points up casualties have gone up recently. This is exactly the same thing that happened in the surge in Iraq. When you have more troops carrying the fight to the enemy, you get more casualty and casualties. And it takes some time to see the results of that. What Karzai is doing, Karzai is not in, doesn't any, look any worse or any weaker than Maliki did before the surge the in Iraq. He is just hedging his bets partly because of this mm -hmm. deadline. What's the strategic value of Afghanistan to us? Well, remember, Afghanistan was the launching pad for the September 11th attacks. So what President Bush was arguing and what President Obama continues to argue is that we cannot allow Afghanistan to fall 
fall back into the hands of terrorists and extremist forces. And look, remember that during the well, campaign, they can, they can during be, the they campaign, they can develop as terrorists without assuming that and, and that look, status. I understand that argument because we have extremist elements all over we the can world, also including defend our here in the United States, as we have seen world. recently. But look. During the campaign, the reason that Obama had to go forward with the surge in Afghanistan was that he juxtaposed Afghanistan vis-a-vis -vis Iraq. Iraq was the bad war. Afghanistan was the good war. This was a political calculation to accept, what, which was a Bush-Cheney recommendation of the 30,000 troop surge into Afghanistan. Excuse That's me, that why was the not positioning a of it was not a, it was this not was a strictly political, right move, not a political calculation. We were losing the war in Afghanistan, a war that. The Bush Cheney administration should have won Correct. in those no, open. We and cannot the win the war in Afghanistan. Can we accept that? Can we accept that as a the, premise? The, the, the actual, can no, we win no, in the, Afghanistan? The fight, no. I, I can, the fight against Al Qaeda is actually mostly going on in Pakistan. That uh, in Pakistan cities and in Pakistan's tribal areas, and it's, being fought, What's the point? and it's being What's fought the point? with drones. The the point is, it's not that there is absolutely no terrorist threat in Afghanistan, but if you look at the unbelievable amount of money and lives we are putting into trying to rebuild Afghanistan, it is not in direct relate, not in good relationship to the actual terrorist threat that's there. You think we should be out of there? I think we have no choice. This country is not going to sustain. It's not going to sustain an open-ended, endless counterinsurgency yes, campaign. Well, Obama, it, 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 it will will if it's succeeding. Rich, it will your entire if it's succeeding. Argument, with all due respect, yeah. your entire argument is based on a faulty analogy with Iraq. That's the only argument that people have for this case, and the analogy doesn't work. Yeah. The whole point that we wanted, we, things changed in Iraq because the Sunnis switched sides because they had no choice. There's no analog to that in Afghanistan. Right. And, well, and, and, and the Iraqis may still be getting ready to have their civil war once we get out. Afghanistan I mean, started no Afghanistan looked okay until 05 and 06. It started deteriorating. Right. The idea that it has to continually deteriorate forever is just it's you rank think it's fatalism. It only you only think it's okay. we weren't looking. You think it's one of those? You know what? With the it right you can, you can, you can get the Taliban to the point where it's, it's a not an existential threat why? to the government. And it's a, a manageable uncertainty. With the right strategy, manageable. What are we going to do? Stay over John, there. And the Afghan, and eventually, the Afghans fight it. John, the Afghans fight it. With the right strategy, the right combination of forces on the ground, and the right general, you know, it you is. And you know what? Your, your question, you excuse me. Uh, your Bob? question about <laughs> Karzai throwing in his mouth. All right, exit. We're going to give him another star. He's a two-star general now. Exit question on a political damage scale: zero to ten. Zero meaning zero damage. Ten meaning politically dead. How much could the Afghan Afghanistan war, as things stand now, hurt Obama. Well, it depends on whether he succeeds or fails. Give me a zero. Well, time. look, it depends on whether he succeeds or fails. If he sees us through and succeeds, it'll be a benefit. If he loses, it won't. It hasn't hurt him yet. Uh, he's sure now that, got. Sure he's that. now got the general, who is the last best hope to make it work. If that doesn't work, and Petraeus sucks us in further, I think it has the potential McChrystal, of McChrystal, overwhelming this McC presidency. I would give it an I, eight. McChrystal, this was McChrystal's uh, aufgabe, his special area. And he knew it for, uh, even more than Petraeus. Petraeus has to get up to speed on Afghanistan. No, no, no Petraeus was, no, was Petraeus McChrystal's doctrine, boss. No, but it was implemented, it was but, implemented, but, yes, implemented but by... But Petraeus was, was McChrystal's boss, and he is keeping in mind the whole region. He's looking at Pakistan and Iran, and so I think he has a better perspective of putting, looking at the big picture, which may... And even Wait, which may Hold on, Monica, we're going to go to your out. notes. Well, I, look, a million things could happen. If you're going to ask me for a number, I would say five. But this really What's depends. What's that number? It's five. I'm splitting the baby. I'm wimping out. <laughs> well, what, but it, what, what it is depends, it? A calculation of what? It depends on whether or not the commander in chief is going to give the new commanding general Petraeus the time and resources he needs in order to do this. You asked about Hamid Karzai. The reason he's throwing his lot with the Taliban is because Obama set a timeline for, for withdrawal. He's going to need the Taliban to deal with the ethnic and tribal and political consequences of an American exit. Peter. I think this really may go down as actually the worst week of the Obama presidency. Because by bringing in Petraeus, he's actually put in someone who is so powerful. And Petraeus will be valuable in sustaining public support for the war at home more than McChrystal has. But what he's done is he's put in someone so powerful that I think he may end up having to renege on that June deadline and go all in on counterinsurgency, even though I think he does not want to. And once he does that, then his presidency is going to rise and fall quite likely <laughs> on what happens in Afghanistan. And because I'm pessimistic about Afghanistan, I I think that's a grim possibility. You're talking about mid-year next year. I think this is going to define, this would well define him all the way into a second term. It'll kill him. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't, I wouldn't go quite that far, but I think it's right now the single biggest danger to no, his presidency. this is his Vietnam, and he's got to get out of there, and the best way out 
is to let uh, the president of Afghanistan cut a deal with the Taliban. And the Pakistanis. And then uh, we, we, we were happy to help you, but now we're, it's your baby. Issue two, moratorium, no more. I've issued a six-month moratorium on deep water drilling. We need to know the facts before we allow deep water drilling to continue. No deep water drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. President Obama last month issued a six-month moratorium on all seabed oil drilling that goes 500 feet or deeper below the level of the sea. But this week, a federal judge in Louisiana ruled that the Department of the Interior had failed to provide any adequate reasoning for the ban, wherewith the judge, Martin Fellman, struck it down. Quote, the blanket moratorium with no parameters seems to assume that because one rig failed, and although no one yet fully knows why, all companies and rigs drilling new wells over 500 feet also universally present an imminent danger. The court is unable to divine or fathom a relationship between the findings and the immense scope of the moratorium, unquote. The immense scope of the moratorium is not only a matter of physics, but a matter of economics. Listen to this. Drilling platforms closed, 33. Wages lost July to December, the upcoming six months, one to two billion dollars. Jobs lost in the Gulf, July to December, the upcoming six months, 46,000. Question, why is Obama insistent on a moratorium? Why didn't he grab this opportunity to reverse course? I ask you, Ellen. Well, he asked for a moratorium because there are many drills that are dr drilling in the deep water, like the BP dr drill, that we do not have uh, adequate safety backup plans for. And we saw that visibly displayed on Capitol Hill when the CEOs all had the same safety plan that they presented. It talked about protecting the seals and the walruses in the Gulf, and it had a phone number of a scientist who had died several years ago. So if there were a leak on the scale of what BP cannot control, there would be no capability of stopping it. So I think it's appropriate to have a pause to do a safety check. Obama. And I would point out that the, that the federal judge has uh, extensive holdings in the oil and gas industry. How and much? Uh, enough to uh, question whether he should have <laughs> withdrawn himself really? because of conflict of really? interest. The, the Obama but, team is insistent on the moratorium because, in the words of Rahm Emanuel, never let a serious crisis go to waste, and they wanted to use this as a pretext to push uh, cap and trade. But I read the judge's ruling on this, and what he said was that the six-month moratorium was, in fact, punitive because it was too broad, it was too arbitrary, and it wasn't adequately justified given the impact on tens of thousands of oil worker jobs and the impact on the local community. So now what the Interior Department is going to do is try to redo the rule, much more nuanced, much more narrow ban, just and only restrict it to certain rigs in a limited time period. Help, that might be more appropriate than this sweeping ban. This. I, I was under the impression that conservatives were against judicial activism, <laughs> that they wanted policies to be made by the elected branches. Here you have the biggest natural disaster environment in American history. Yes, Obama switches policy the course, the and a was, judge in New Orleans <laughs> says we can't do no, it. Pass, Imagine, pass, let's see, pass a law. Let's just pass so we a don't law. Pass, okay. pass a law. All right. I'm, pass a law. No, I'm yeah, getting, I, I, thought pass the, he, I thought it was all the, the elected branches the conservatives wanted to defer to. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm getting and bored by this issue. <laughs> issue three, superpower comrades. Welcome, my friend and partner, uh, President Medvedev. The President of Russia, Dmitry Medvedev, paid an official visit to the White House this week. The two leaders met ahead of two summits in Ontario, Canada, the G8 and the G20 summits. Presidents Obama and Medvedev will head to Canada, not as enemies, but as superpower allies. Question, that's right. Russia today is a superpower. Got that? Russia is a superpower. Yes or no? 
uh, Peter. No, in fact, the whole reason that we're on better terms with them because their economy has totally tanked, and that's in fact why they've really they've, they've come to the table. I they've, thought their economy was doing better than ours. Is. Uh, no, I think they've been hurt worse by the financial crisis than us, and that's part of the reason they're desperate for this foreign investment. I think it's part of the reason that Obama has actually gotten somewhere so on Iran and on Afghanistan. You're, you're denying Russia's superpower status today. <laughs> that's so <laughs> hurtful. Absolutely. Are you denying? Are you denying? I, I feel of confident course, in that. It's about half the population of the Soviet Union, half the industrial potential doesn't have an ideology that has any appeal to anyone. It's a regional power, one you have to pay attention to, but there's no way to possibly argue it's yeah, a superpower. You know what you mean ideology? It Communism <laughs> is relatively dead in Russia. You it's know dead. That. It right. does not have an ideology that has international it has, appeal. It has, it has, it has nationalism it, and a president for life yeah. whose name is not it, Medvedev. It's <laughs> Vladimir and, and Putin. Well, he's not going to be president. Right. He's going to run he's for the seat everything. now held by he's Medvedev, and Medvedev is going to run for his seat. In the mind's eye of the Russians, they are a superpower, and I think it is correct on the part of President Obama to play to those aspirations, to give them that spot on the world stage. He gets along and, and with Medvedev, yeah. and yeah. he's doing it at the expense of Putin. They're both lawyers, well, the same you know, generation. You really, you really they have to tell us that because whatever Obama does, it is enlightened. Look, Russia does <laughs> not <laughs> Russia does not currently have the power portfolio to put it up at superpower status, but it does have nuclear weapons, and it also has uh, it has the the mean? ability what is it missing to missing superpower. Is well, China a economy, political, is China a cultural. No, but they're they're getting. How many superpowers? They're are getting to superpower one, status one, one. only in certain categories. <laughs> but the, power. It, the Russians it, it, do have the ability to the, the make mischief. Thing, the important thing is this. Russia was on its way to an alliance with the real potential superpower, which is China. And what Obama is doing, I think, effectively, is by creating a closer relationship between Russia and the U.S., he's making it less likely that you're going to see a de facto partnership between Russia and China. Issue four, Haley's Comet. The truth is that we had a movement in South Carolina, and the movement was it's not about being Republican, it's about being conservative. Nikki Haley this week took a big step towards making South Carolina Political history. She defeated South Carolina Congressman Gresham Barrett and won by more than 30 points. Nikki Haley is now the Republicans' candidate for South Carolina governor. If Haley wins less than six months from now, she will be the first female governor in South Carolina history, taking her place among other famous South Carolinian governors, notably Strom Thurmond. From background on Haley, married, husband, Michael, two children, Rena and Nalen, Clemson University, BS Accounting, Chief Financial Officer, Exotica International, Woman's Clothing Line, 94 to 04, State Representative, three two-year terms, 04 and currently, State Representative, Majority Whip, 06 and currently. Haley insists that if she wins, she will shake up the political establishment. That shakeup includes barring state lawmakers from voting on bills anonymously. I want term limits. I want to make sure that every legislator has to disclose their income so we know exactly who's paying them. And I want every legislator to have to vote on the record, which is not happening in South Carolina. Question, how big a factor was the Tea Party in Nikki Haley's win, Rich Lowry? It was big, and it shows the, the charge that Tea Partiers are racist is a total smear. What they want is con- uh, candidates who are conservative and not anti-establishment, and sh- she fit the bill in both ways. And she's part of one of the most important deep political trends this year, which is the rise of the pro-life woman. What uh, other uh, primary was won by a female thanks to the Tea Party? Quickly, quickly. Sharon Angle. Nevada. Sharon Nevada. Angle Sharon Nevada. Angle, right? Yep. Right. Well, uh, I think Sarah Palin's endorsement was actually more critical than the Tea Party support. She was she was in the back of the pack. Well, she brought the Tea Party, party in. Yeah, yeah. Until yeah. Sarah Sorry. Palin went in and endorsed her. She's the de facto she leader is, of the Tea she, Party, by the way. Uh, they like her, but they like they like Ron Paul okay. even better. I mean, but I'm, she I'm, is an Indian American version of Sarah Palin. India of the nation of she, India, the yeah, nation attra- of India. She's attractive, she's spirited, and she's very conservative. And she has something Sarah Palin doesn't have. She's in Uh-oh. a state that really matters Uh-oh. to the Republican primary okay, so nominating so contest. So the news. Well, hold on. This is the nicest thing she's ever done. Ever yeah, said that's South, Sa- South Carolina matters to the Republican Party to the nominating yeah. process. So, so everybody's going to be kissing her ring. Yeah. Is is this uh, gender uh, dominating politics with you? 
No, I welcome the, I think the Republican Party is delighted to kind of begin to shed its image as a white male party and to yeah, bring in some more women and people of color. Yeah, but I, I haven't I had you, have heard you say anything nice about <laughs> the Republicans, and I, you know, I welcome it, <laughs> even though it may be a it's gender, hard, it may hard. be a, gen, a gender decision. Nikki Haley, you go, girl. She is so impressive. And what you're seeing is like a very what? diverse, like you're seeing a, well, she's a fiscal conservative. She comes off as normal. In, in this election cycle, voters want, they're rejecting professional politicians. They want normalcy. They want fiscal responsibility. That's what she's running on. But also, when you look at the new breed of women in the Republican Party, there is a great diversity. You've got Carly Fiorina running for the Senate in California, Meg Whitman running for governor of California. Now you've got Nikki Haley. Some yeah. are socially okay, conservative. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, excuse wait, me, but Meg trend? Whitman right, is hold. a pro-choice so, Republican. So, so, diversity. Before you speak, the reason why Haley won is, is not her gender. The, not her campaigning. She's an outsider. She yeah. had the look of the outside. Absolutely. And, 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 and the Barrett looked like the inside. The and the political inside. But she is an insider because she's a member yes, of the it, state legislature. Well, but in that way, in that way she no. is like Sarah Palin because she was running against, Palin also ran against a pretty corrupt Republican establishment. Right. But so I what does that I think tell before you? we read too if much you, into this. If you, if you win as the outsider, what does that tell you? What we've it learned tells from you this, the incumbency is out. What we've learned from this is the news flash that in the Republican Party in South Carolina, one of the two or three most conservative states in the country, the Tea Party has a lot of influence. News flash. News flash. <laughs> her, her opponent <laughs> said that she was trend. having extramarital with, affairs. What, what do you think about that rap, by the way? Within the le legislature, she was a change agent. And these charges played as kind of good old boy politics as usual and kind of it helped give her even more anti-establishment. Two GOP operatives that. said that she had extramarital relations. It blew up in their face. Right, because in fact, voters probably voted for her because of the phoniness of that charge. Right, and so she won because of the right, tactics of the GOP. Right, because she was smeared. And also those who were making, making the charges had no evidence of this. And in this year, dirty politics is out. Voters want to know, right. lower my taxes well, and cut spending. Open she also <laughs> said if any evidence is brought forward, she would resign if elected. So that's a pretty Sherman-esque statement. Obama's approval rating is 45% today. Where will it be in November five months from now? Mid 40s, I say 43 because I'm an optimist. <laughs> Hovering just under 50%, which is where Pew Higher than it is him. now. Yes. I no, think he'll be at is. 43, which is the danger zone for presidents. Eleanor's right. He's already at basically 50. He'll stay there. It will basically be at 42%. Take it, take it to the bank. <laughs> bye bye. Investing takes perspective. It comes from navigating up and down markets for 60 years, spotting opportunities at home and abroad. Global investing from Franklin Templeton Investments. Gain from our perspective.